Would a loving God send people to hell? I think the answer is a pretty clear no, but J. Warner Wallace of Cold Case Christianity seems to think the answer is yes. Let's talk about that. Now, before we dive into Wallace's video specifically, I'd like to first give a general overview of why I think the answer is no. A loving God would not send people to hell, which we can understand as a place or state of unending suffering. If I wanted to have a child, and I knew there was a good chance that my child would end up in horrible pain, not just for a long time, not just for the rest of their lives, but literally forever until the end of time, but I went ahead and had a child anyway. Taking that risk would be very far from the loving thing for me to do. Now, you could at least cut me some slack for not being perfect. But God? God is supposed to be perfectly loving, or at least maximally loving. How could such a being even consider taking this kind of risk, especially given how many people are on the highway to hell, both right now and throughout history? In my day job as an engineer, I need to consider the ways in which my designs might fail. If a particular piece of it breaks, for example, what happens? Does the product simply stop functioning, or does it suddenly pose a serious safety risk to the user? And how likely is this piece to break in the first place? Now, if I designed a system for managing human souls after death, and if my system contained a likely failure mode where a soul would be tortured literally forever, that would be beyond unacceptable. That is literally off the scale of standard failure analysis tools. And yet, this is apparently how God chose to do things. This is not just bad engineering on God's part, but it also betrays a profound lack of love for his creations. In fact, you'd think that the loving thing to do would be to simply forgive people, wouldn't it? Why can't God just forgive us so that no one goes to hell? You might be wondering, well, why can't God just forgive? If God can do anything, can't he just announce that we're forgiven? Well, yes, God can do anything, but he can do anything consistent with his moral nature. God is the holy, righteous judge of the universe. Therefore, he can't be indifferent to sin. Okay, I'm going to skip the part about God's omnipotence is limited by his nature because I have a future video planned for that. So, for now, I'd just like to point out that, actually, the Bible does contain at least one example of God simply forgiving people on a whim. In Psalm 78, God forgives people who aren't even sorry because he understands that they are but flesh. But they flattered him with their mouths, they lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him, they were not true to his covenant. Yet he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Often he restrained his anger and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not come again. In fact, Jesus himself commanded us to forgive each other in this way. We are expected to just forgive. No sacrifice, no apology. We're just supposed to forgive. Are we being held to a higher standard than God himself? Are we more loving than God? Why can't God just forgive people the way we are expected to forgive each other? That would seem to be the loving thing to do, and it seems that God is capable of doing it, so why doesn't he? For all these reasons, it seems indefensible to suggest that a loving God could possibly send people to hell. So what does J. Warner Wallace of Cold Case Christianity have to say about this? Let's watch. Would a loving God send people to hell? A loving God would not do that, would he? I mean, does that make sense? At the same time, I know from working criminal trials that if I don't seek justice, the kind of justice that will eventually put one killer in jail for the rest of his life and punish him, even potentially to send a killer to death row, if you didn't do that, if you didn't seek justice for the victim's family, you are actually doing harm to the victim's family. Well, if that's the case, then it would seem that it's impossible to actually be omnibenevolent. If God has to make trade-offs between multiple people, then he can't really be perfectly loving to everyone involved. Now, maybe if God had only created one person, he wouldn't have this problem. 
but it does seem that if you have multiple people whose emotional well-beings are incompatible, then you cannot be perfectly loving to both of them. Kids, kids, you're both right! Wallace's own example of sending someone to prison or death actually seems to show that it's not possible for God to be perfectly loving to everyone, and that God chose to do the less loving thing by creating more than one person. How loving would it be to those who aren't Hitler if they're to receive the exact same consequence as Hitler? But hell is not only for Hitler. If Wallace's version of Christianity is true, then even someone like me is going to hell, and my Christian friends and family are not going to be happy about this. Is this really the loving thing for God to do if he's considering the feelings of people who aren't going to hell? At this very moment, there are Christians who are terrified by the idea that their friends and families might be going to hell. Are these Christians feeling the love? Are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? No, they're not, because this is not the loving thing to do. This idea that God sends people to hell out of concern for the emotional well-being of others simply does not work, and Christians themselves are walking proof of this. To be loving to the offender is to be unloving to the offended. In the end, there must be a balance between the love of God. The love of God necessitates the justice of God, the judgment of God. You cannot have one logically without the other. Well, if there must be a balance between love and justice, then that would seem to prove that God cannot be perfectly loving and perfectly just at the same time. If you have to make trade-offs between two behaviors, then you cannot perfectly embody both of those behaviors. And you know what? Come to think of it, even if we were talking about Hitler himself, I don't think I would want him to go to hell forever. Give him, like, a thousand years of unimaginable pain. I think my sense of justice would be more than satisfied by that. Or, if that's not enough, then maybe give him, like, five years times the roughly 18 million people he killed over that period of time. But for fuck's sake, not even Hitler deserves a literally infinite stay in hell. That is a disturbing thought, even if it's Hitler. If the only thing that will satisfy your sense of justice and make you feel loved is a literal eternity of suffering for another person, I'm sorry, but I think you need to do some serious introspection. But let me give you a second way to think about this. Sometimes when we talk about the, the fact that God would send someone to hell, we gotta be careful how we use this word send. It almost sounds like God is um, forcing someone to some place they don't want to be. Well, let me ask you, if God, if there are people, and I know today, who have no desire to be with God, and their idea of eternity and bliss is not to spend eternity with God. They reject God now. They don't imagine themselves enjoying any time with God. God will not force people into his presence who have spent their entire life denying his existence. That's how loving God is, that he will not force you. He will allow you to make a choice. Ah yes, the classic, God doesn't send you to hell, you choose hell by rejecting God and not wanting to be in his presence, and that's what hell really is. But why would God send anybody to hell? Part of the answer is that God doesn't send people to hell. If C.S. Lewis is right in his classic book, The Great Divorce, God doesn't send people to hell, people choose it. Right, so, couple of questions. First, if hell is just separation from God, which a person chooses for themselves, which is why the experience is unpleasant because God is all things good, then why couldn't God simply annihilate those souls that are destined for hell? That would seem to be the loving thing for God to do, rather than having them suffer forever. I mean, heck, when a dog is suffering with no hope of recovery, most of us agree that the humane thing to do is to put the dog down. That is the loving thing to do in that situation. But apparently, God doesn't love us as much as we love dogs. No, we need to lie there, nursing a condition that will never get better, literally forever, because God loves us. In fact, annihilation would seem to solve the other problem Wallace mentioned, wherein people don't want to receive the same consequence as Hitler. If good people go to heaven, while well, Hitler et al. get annihilated, well, problem solved. You got treated infinitely better than Hitler. And second question, if hell is just separation from God, then why don't non-Christians live in a kind of hell on earth? 
I don't love God. I haven't accepted him into my heart. So why am I not suffering some kind of hell right now? How does dying suddenly make things worse? And if my earthly existence is somehow a stopgap measure, holding back the painful reality of being separated from God, then why wouldn't a loving God set up something similar after I die? If my soul can't be annihilated for some reason, then surely a loving God would make this kind of stopgap last forever, right? Why not? And those choices determine our consequences. Why would we think that people who would reject God for their entire life would suddenly want to spend eternity with God? I think this is really us about not thinking through the nature of our desires. Okay, so here's an interesting thought. We humans have a lot of desires and thoughts that make us incompatible with eternal happiness in heaven. Our sense of novelty, our social ties that might get broken, and even our memories of pain that we may recall. So it would seem that God would have to reshape us to quite a substantial degree in order to make us compatible with heaven, as indeed the YouTuber Noel Plum pointed out in his video, Heaven? I'd sooner be dead. And in fact, a recent guest on Capturing Christianity also professed this idea that God has to fundamentally change us before we can enter heaven. There's also the side of salvation that deals with regeneration and sanctification. So here's what you need to understand about Hitler. Hitler in heaven will be like Jesus. Hitler in heaven will see his sins through the eyes of Jesus and hate them as much as the most righteously devout person hates them. Hitler will have undergone the kind of transformation that will make him a completely new man in Jesus Christ. So if God is already in the business of transforming or sanctifying us before we get to heaven, altering our desires and opinions in these ways, then why couldn't God just make us feel differently about him? What's one more change on top of all the others? Now, you might want to say that making someone love you like that isn't really love, but strictly speaking, it is. If God snapped his fingers and made you feel love toward him, guess what? That would mean that you now love God. Even if a feeling has been artificially created, that feeling still exists. You really do feel that way, and you would really love God. Of course, if you suddenly found yourself loving God by a deliberate artificial act on his part, you would probably feel a bit manipulated. But once again, if he's already in the business of manipulating you to make you compatible with heaven, and if everyone in heaven is supposedly fine with this, does it really matter if God manipulates you in this other way as well? Would anyone actually care? And you know what? I'm going to nail my flag to the mast on this one. If God does exist, and if God tells me that I can either choose to go to hell or I can choose to have him snap his fingers and make me love him, I'd probably choose the divine lobotomy. I realize that's not the proud, rebellious thing to do, but it's probably what I would choose. Why didn't you just fix me? It was within your power to fix me. The only person who might not be happy about this situation is God himself. And I can certainly appreciate, from my flawed human perspective, that making someone love you like that would feel a bit hollow. But surely, a perfectly loving God would not be so in love with himself that he would prioritize his own appreciation of organic love over the literally infinite suffering of his children. Right? I don't think most Christians believe in a God who would be so petty and selfish as to make so many people suffer for his own satisfaction. Now, if you do believe in such a being, if you are some kind of Molinist Christian, well, all right then, it's your monster. But one wonders why such a self-absorbed being would bother creating anything in the first place, let alone how such a being could be called loving. Even if you were the best person on earth by every conceivable metric, no one would describe you as a loving person on account of your raging narcissism. But let me give you a third way to think about this. What do we even mean when we use the word hell? We could talk about what do we mean when we say that God sends people to hell? What do we mean when we use the word hell? Do you realize that most of your notions about hell are dictated more and shaped more by the culture around us 
and the fictional accounts we've read about, the fiery and Dante's Inferno. These are notions of hell that we have now placed into the biblical construct rather than let the Bible tell us the truth about hell. In other words... Now, it's not that I disagree with this, but... Actually, if you read the Gospels in light of what ancient Jews believed about death and the coming apocalypse, you realize that our modern conception of hell is almost entirely a product of these kinds of cultural distortions, and it's almost completely divorced from what Jesus taught and what ancient Jews believed. Ancient Jews did not believe in a dualistic afterlife of punishment or reward. They believed that everyone who died went to a place called Sheol, which is a nebulous kind of catch-all term for the grave or the nothingness after death, where you cannot praise God or do much of anything. They also believed that when the apocalypse finally came, God would breathe life back into the physical bodies of everyone who had died, raising them from the dead so they may be judged. Those deemed unrighteous would be annihilated, while those deemed righteous would be given perfect bodies with which to live forever on earth in the new kingdom of God. Indeed, if you read the Gospels and the letters of Paul with this framework in mind, it actually makes a lot of sense of what Jesus and Paul are saying, and there really are only a few scattered places in the Bible where you can plausibly argue for our modern conception of hell. All right, that was a very long tangent. Back to Wallace. These are notions of hell that we have now placed into the biblical construct rather than let the Bible tell us the truth about hell. In other words, how many times have you thought of hell as a place of eternal torture? When the word torture is never used anywhere in the scriptures, the word torment is used. Oh, well that just makes it all better, doesn't it? Don't worry, we're not going to torture you forever, we're just going to torment you forever. See, if it was torture, that would just be mean. But because it's torment, that's loving. But I can be an eternal torment. Listen, regret is a form of eternal torment. I can just regret the decisions I made in my life that landed me here. For someone who was just so insistent on reading what the Bible actually says, Wallace seems surprisingly willing to interpolate the meaning of the word torment. The only places in the New Testament where the word torment is used in passages which supposedly describe hell are in Luke in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and throughout Revelation and maybe 2 Peter 2.8. These passages don't exactly support Wallace's comforting idea of hell being something like an unpleasant memory. Again, if indeed these passages are describing a literal afterlife for humans. The story of the rich man and Lazarus, for example, has the rich man being tormented by fire, begging for even just a drop of water. Not exactly on par with personal feelings of regret. The other notion I would have to ask is, do we think that everyone in separation from God in hell do we think that everyone there is suffering the exact same experience? Or do we think that there are degrees of punishment in hell? It turns out you can make a very strong case for degrees of punishment in hell. What that means is, for some of us who reject God's existence, it may simply just be the eternal regret that we experience. But the form of punishment that a serial killer experiences in hell, I suspect will be very different than somebody who's just denied God's existence. You suspect, or you can demonstrate. I think that there's levels of punishment that people will experience in hell, and if that's the case, we have to stop allowing our cultural definitions of hell to dictate what we believe about hell. A loving God would honor your choices, not force you into his presence. A loving parent would not honor their child's choice to walk into traffic. A loving parent would hold their child's hand and not let go, even if the child protested. Likewise, a loving child protection services agent would not honor a child's choice to stay with their abusive, manipulative parents. He would make sure justice is given when justice is due. Well, my child walked into traffic, so he deserves to get hit by a car. That's just the logical consequence of his choices. You know, fuck him. It's not like I loved him or anything. He would make sure justice is given when justice is due, because that's what's loving to those who have been victimized. Yeah, because my Christian friends and family feel so victimized by my existence. I just know that as soon as I die, they're going to have a celebration, because they feel victimized for having known me. And finally, he would appropriately deal with those he has separated for all eternity, so that justice is fair for those he is judging. Would it not be appropriate, and indeed loving, to just annihilate those souls? 
Is your thirst for what you call justice so strong that only a literally infinite punishment feels appropriate to you? That's what a loving God would do and why a loving God might use a place like hell to accomplish his mission. For God so loved the sinners that he refused to live up to the standard of love we expect from human parents and dog owners, and he did not give sinners the perfectly reasonable option of annihilation instead of eternal suffering. You know, because he loves you.